Hello, uh, my name is Chloe Pierce and I'm going to be talking to you about my work looking at uh, preserving archaeological bones after excavation for future research. This is part of an AHRC CDP project with English Heritage and Birkbeck University inside the Institute of Mi Mi Microbial and Structural Biology along with UCL. So what are we looking to do? Uh, the overall aims of the project is to establish environmental parameters for the storage and display of archaeological objects, with particular interest in their lower relative humidity limits. This will primarily come down to understanding the relationship between the bone's elastic limit and the relative humidity in which it is stored. Uh, this work will be ex uh, executed alongside extensive analysis to better understand and characterise bone in terms of its preservation, particularly its organic component collagen. And lastly, I'm also hoping to find patterns in preservation relating to burial environment so that perhaps bones can be immediately recommended upon excavation for storage conditions. So, what's at risk? Uh, the 2010 National Audit of the English Heritage Collections highlighted that archaeological bone was the third most damaged archaeological material. This makes around 11% of the material in poor or very poor condition which equates to at least four and a half thousand objects, but this is generally considered to be a bit of a conservative estimate. So what does the damage look like? So the photos on the slide feature examples of displayed objects and they exhibit the most common forms of damage. On the right and in the center, you've got surface powdering and flaking, which are by far the most common that I've observed. However, in more extreme cases, bone can also crack and distort, such as the skull on the left. And this one was caused by the failure of the fusion line between the, uh, the cranial tissue, which was caused by the distortion of the, the plates themselves. So these various types of damage can have different impacts on the um, research potential of the object. Starting with structural failure, it can affect the metric analysis for species and age identification. Dehydration of the collagen can cause uh, the DNA within the bone to be lost uh, further. And finally, the damage to the surface texture can impact the significance of marks from butchery and manufacture techniques. And of course, all of these impact the object's display qualities for uh, museum visitors. So a little bit about what bone is and uh, in terms of what we're interested in for this particular project. So we are just focusing on the cortical tissue that runs down the parallel of long bones um, and it is formed uh, very characteristically of the eon, the osteans on the image of the second to the right which house the Habersham canals that run longitudinally through the bone. And these are formed by concentric rings called lamellas, which consist of differently orientated collagen fibrils which provide the strength for the bone. Um, and this internal structure has been has developed over millennia and um, varies differently between different individuals to match different people's and animals' motor patterns. So the main focus of the project inside the bone is the collagen. Uh, so this is type 1 collagen. Um, it makes up about 25 to 30 percent of the bone and accounts for about 40 percent of its volume. It's formed by a, an amino acids bonding and these formed to create molecular chains, which then self-aggregate into fibrils and cross-link for structural stability. So we have an atomic microscopy image on the left, uh, which shows the characteristic D-banding, which shows collagen in good condition. Now, this is formed, so all these lines here match up to this one-quarter delayed um, layout of the collagen. And that is how you, that's one of the easiest ways to indicate that it's in good condition. So once these are formed, these uh, fibrils then mineralize, and it's uh, done by a form of carbonated hydroxyapatite, which I'll refer to as bioapatite from this point. They first form in the gaps between the fibrils and gradually move into the collagen structure itself. And this process is complete once all the water in the collagen has been replaced by the minerals. Uh, so the precise formation of quantities of these elements varies between um, species, but they also vary between individuals, and different sources of bones give different quantities as well. And these precise elements provide the bone strength. 
The collagen provides the toughness and helps prevent crack propagation, whereas the bioapatite provides stiffness and the rigidity of the bone. So you need both, and you need both in perfect harmony. And then you put it in the ground for a really long time. So during burial, they undergo diagenesis, which is a very complex and slow process and is influenced by a large number of intrinsic and extrinsic factors. And these often vary across the site and also can vary within an individual. And on the slide, you can see a couple of these practices. So on an individual level, the age of the individual can affect the, the maturity of the tissue, which then infects, affects its structure and its integrity. Post-mortem practices, such as those in funerary rites, cooking and butchery, can also have a long-term influence on this process. So the in, uh, inclusion of certain minerals during embalmment can slow it down, whereas cooking will often gelatinize the collagen and accelerate the process. And finally, the differences in the burial environment can result in either the accelerated loss of the collagen or the mineral, which causes a slightly different route of diagenesis throughout the entire process, and it also impacts the type and prevalence of microbes within the soil. And this is largely linked to the acidity of the soil and the oxygen content. So how am I going to do all of this stuff? So a large number of analytical techniques are being used to um, fully understand the bone and its properties. Um, so I'll talk about a couple of them in detail. So to, uh, firstly, to quantify the different uh, components, we're going to be doing thermogravimetric analysis. Infrared spectroscopy and atomic force microscopy will be used to characterize the collagen, whereas um, a form of elemental analysis uh, will be used to quantify the mineral components. Modern bone samples have also been sourced from a local butcher and manually defleshed. These will then undergo accelerated aging in different temperatures and relative humidities. Um, so we can look at whether we can recreate a uh, the conditions of archaeological bone. And we are also looking into creating analog samples through collagen gels taken from the dentistry research, which will allow me to control the exact quantities of the collagen and the minerals. So the overall project is looking to carry out three-point bending, which will observe the impact of the differing relative humidities on the bone's mechanical properties. Uh, but the work will only be seeking to find the object's elastic limit, as we're not looking to go as far as the plastic deformation that comes with the more extreme cases. So we're uh, only looking to find when it starts to, do, uh, to break and it will return comfortably back where it was. So um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've done so far using infrared spectroscopy and thermogravimetric analysis. So on the slide are the sites so far that have been uh, had samples collected. Uh, they represent uh, four different burial environments, which vary quite a lot in terms of their acidity um, and things such as elemental phosphorus, which is quite important to the bone's diagenesis, and things like where they relate to the Chalk River, which runs along the south of the UK. So generally, the Roman sites in the north uh, Corbridge and Halsteads have got statistically better burial environments. Um, so they are largely Roman and medieval in origin and are and not at this stage very uh, evenly spread across the country. Um, uh, the excavations date between the 1960s and the 1980s and they have been in uh, English heritage stores ever since with the northern ones, uh, Corbridge and Halsted, stored at Corbridge Roman site, whereas Battle Abbey, Camber Castle and Maison Dieu, all in the south, have been stored at Dover Castle. Now between these sites, the, um, do, between these stores, the relative humidity conditions have varied quite significantly, and also each individual site has been stored differently after excavations. So they're in different types of bags and different types of boxes. So we've got a lot of variation in terms of that. And this is what they look like. Um, so at the moment, they are largely unidentified in terms of species, although zooarchaeological assemblage work was carried out after excavation. Um, and as you can see, they're all long bones, probably from different animals and 
from different parts of the limbs. However, before destructive analysis is carried out, uh, Dr. Polly Dora Baker from Historic England will be coming over to identify and carry out all metric analysis, so nothing's lost there. Uh, they all exhibit a different colour and they have a range of surface textures which reflects the different burial environments and storage conditions. So regarding the issue of having different species, um, it has been decided that because the English Heritage Collection encompasses so many different species, it would be good for our project to use a range of different um, animals and different ages as well. Um, so then we can reflect the, the collection more accurately. And it has also been suggested in the literature that the variations between species are on the same level as the variations within a body. So it's not too significant in terms of the difference. So on the slide we've got um, the initial thermogravimetric analysis, um, where the, the samples were heated to 800 degrees and the weight loss measured across the board. So as you can see, uh, the relative uh, percentage loss of the water, the organics, and the material, uh, mineral content. Um, so most of the archaeological material has 10 to 15% um, uh, organics, probably collagen at this stage, whereas the modern cattle bone at the bottom has near to 30%. However, as you can see, Corbridge on the on second one down has just over 25% organic material. This makes it quite a significant outlier. However, further research will be needed to identify whether that whole bone is a significant outlier or just the little bit that I drilled for this research is the outlier because the bone's conditions often vary significantly even within one object. So each one will have to be analyzed several times. And uh, on the slide, currently we have the um, infrared spectroscopy um, information. Uh, it can be used to characterize both the mineral and the collagen content, however I'm going to be largely focusing on the collagen content, and we have the normalized results on the slide. So key parts of the collagen uh, infrared spectroscopy are amide 1, 2 and 3, as you can see uh, labeled on the slide. And again they show that, um, that the com a direct comparison between the Corbridge site and the modern bone, which indicates that the collagen is in good condition in, co in the Corbridge sample. However, we will also be looking into undertaking further research to break down the amide 1 peak into its individual structural components, which will help to explain the condition of the collagen in more detail. So using this information, there is a hope to uh, apply uh, work that's been carried out in the damage assessment of parchment, which showed a correlation between organic content and the absorption of the AMI2 peak. However, as you can see on the slide, there's no correlation. This is not a huge surprise given the amount of variation you can get within bone, um, but ideally towards the end we'll be able to start a picture, build a picture suggesting that certain sites have certain patterns, and ideally that if you've got uh, high collagen content, you can assume it's in bad condition and things like that. Okay, so I'd like to thank all my supervisors and thanks for listening.